All right, we're going to get started. Um, I am Tom Kelly, and welcome to our Bank Council Roundtable for uh, the month of October. Today's topic, Alternatives to Bankruptcy, What Lenders Should Know When Considering Their Borrower Defaults. Um, I'll be presenting today with two of my colleagues from our Palo Alto office, Jessica McKinley and Tom Huang. And uh, we're going to uh, proceed through the slides we've got here, but uh, this works best for us if it's an interactive presentation. So if people have questions along the way or points that they would like to interject, corrections when I'm speaking, uh, feel free to do that, and we will also do that with each other's presentation. So with that, Tom and Jessica, take it away. Great. Thanks, everyone, for being here. There are CLE sign-up sheets um, at each of the tables here, here in the room here, and um, if you're listening in, get, get us your contact information um, so we can get you uh, CLE or CPE credit, uh, whatever you're seeking there. So. Let's talk about bankruptcy before we talk about alternatives to bankruptcy. There are some benefits of bankruptcy that many in this room are probably very familiar with. Um, the first one is that it is a court supervised and usually an orderly process. Uh, it's rare that anything happens in bankruptcy court without an order authorizing it to happen. Um, and creditors are required to get relief from stay to proceed. So that protects some creditors uh, who may not be first to the table because other creditors cannot seize assets without court, court permission to do so. The benefit of bankruptcy also is we can recover avoidable and preferential transfers, uh, formerly known as fraudulent transfers. The Avoidable Transfer Act allows uh, the bankruptcy court to enter an order after an adversary proceeding to recover money that was fraudulently transferred within the past two years. Um, or uh, pref preferences if it's not to an insider within the last 90 days. And so that can be a benefit of bankruptcy if you know a major transfer had taken place that was out of the ordinary course of business and was a significant asset of the debtor. Uh, another benefit of bankruptcy is assets are sold free and clear of liens. Uh, with proceeds attaching to the liens, uh, which is a power that the bankruptcy court has that isn't really available in other proceedings. Um, and there's also a section in the code called 363M, which gives good faith purchasers a lot of benefits um, and uh, is a valuable thing for those purchasers to have if they're buying assets out of bankruptcy. And finally, there are lease damages limits in bankruptcy. so. The landlord is not able to uh, collect uh, all of the lease damages that they could normally collect outside of bankruptcy. And Tom will tell us some of the downsides of bankruptcy. Uh, sure. Um, just real quick to touch upon uh, on the slides here, we have uh, another thing that bankruptcy provides for lenders. And I just wanted to add in that list, um, sometimes lenders might be seeking a third party release and you can get that in the in a bankruptcy, which could be valuable as well. Um, so there's a slide about uh, downsides to bankruptcies. They're listed here, they're expensive. bankruptcies are expensive. Um, you know, typically you're, for, to do a going concern sale, you do it in the chapter 11. And these were meant for um, you know, restructuring large public companies. Um, there's fees for all professionals. There might be a committee appointed. There might be a couple committees appointed. And you never know what the committee is going to do, um, how they're going to conduct themselves during the case. So there might be a lot of fees there. Um, the U.S. trustee is also required. Um, you're required to pay uh, quarterly fees to the U.S. trustee as well. Um, you need to provide notice sometimes to all parties uh, in the case, and that could be expensive as well. Um, and then, because uh, it's such a public forum, there's a lot of uncertainty involved. So um, the debtor will, will uh, maintain control of the process usually uh, and subject to a, a secured party or a dip lender um, negotiating certain um, certain rights or controls uh, in the case. So for example, they could um, require, the, uh, require the debtor to provide budgets, um, you know, uh, to adhere to budgets and, and reporting. Um, 
And then your, the significant events in the case are unpredictable. You don't know how, um, what parties are going to come in. You don't know where all the you know, bones are buried, et cetera. So that kind of just works itself out during the case. But it could um, lead to a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of time to deal with a lot of these issues because in the next point, um, you know, there's a lot of unanticipated issues and you need time and court approval to deal with a lot of these things. Um, and then the last point is reputation. Um, so there's, you know, the bankruptcy could lead to a uh, loss of goodwill and to, uh, you know, loss of customers as well. And that's important, especially, especially if you're seeking to uh, sell as a going concern and maintain going concern value. So um, that leads us to uh, kind of why we're here, because borrowers and lenders, and actually a lot of other constituents are involved with the alternative approaches to bankruptcy, given you know, the various factors we just outlined. And three that we're going to talk about today, when going concern value is, is significant, are receiverships, assignments for the benefit of the creditors, and um, doing a sale uh, through UCC or just a straight asset sale um, using a CRO. So the first uh, alternative we're discussing is receivership. And the first receivership I ever worked on was a dairy case. And I feel like a lot of attorneys get to work on some sort of dairy case at some point in their career. And it's always very interesting issues. Um, receivership starts with a lawsuit, usually a secured creditor, but it doesn't have to be, brings a complaint and also a motion to appoint a receiver. And the debtor can consent to this process or not. Um, sometimes they're, they're pre-planned and sometimes they're not. Uh, and there's multiple grounds and it depends somewhat on your jurisdiction, but some of the grounds that are considered are the insolvency of the debtor, which is usually defined as their ability to pay their debts as they become due, uh, the bad faith or, or you know, um, uh, of the debtor or of management of the debtor, uh, and then mismanagement of the assets of, of the debtor. All those are some considerations that are taken into account. And when you're looking at that question, you need to be very conscious of what jurisdiction you're going to be in. Um, if you're going to be suing a Delaware entity, you can look at Delaware corporate or LLC law to determine what are the proper grounds under that statute for a receivership. But if the assets are located in another jurisdiction, say Minnesota, you can also look whether you've got grounds to get a receiver appointed over the assets in Minnesota that are different than what might be permitted under the Delaware corporate or LLC statute. Yeah, I'll just add that another consideration you want to be aware of is this is an extraordinary relief. So you know, that's something that needs to be considered if you're thinking about going for a receivership as opposed to I'm just doing a foreclosure sale or um, you know, doing the ABC. And so then another question becomes who is the receiver going to be? And this, the receiver is a neutral third party that's appointed by the court. And in some jurisdictions, uh, the, the court gives great deference to the plaintiff's choice for a receiver. The plaintiff can go in and say, this is who we want to be the receiver. In other jurisdictions, it's more of a vetting process. Uh, New York actually requires the receiver to be licensed uh, and, and to have you know, that, that stamp of approval. So that's also something that you want to look at if this is a remedy you're considering. There, there was once a case that I was working on uh, representing a secured creditor where we were contemplating going for a receiver and the, the lender wasn't located here in the Twin Cities, it was located in another state. And the internal counsel there said, do we want to do that? Are they going to appoint our person? Because his experience in a different state was it would be a contributor to the judge's campaign. And so you kind of have to know what the practice is in different states. This was in Wisconsin, where, as here, the courts uh, tend to appoint the requested receiver unless it's contested. And if it's contested, then they'll take evidence as to who should be the receiver. But there are other states where um, the judge may see a receivership, particularly over a substantial business, as a, a lucrative opportunity to reward one of his friends. So receivers' duties are governed by statute, case law, and by court order. And in most jurisdictions, the court order is sort of sacrosanct. It's, it's the most important uh, drafting that you, you can do to make sure that you get the protections in place that you need and the powers in place for the receiver to act. 
Um, a receiver acts as a fiduciary to the constituents, which includes the creditors and um, the other parties in interest. And uh, depending on the type of receivership, um, the receiver is either operating assets or liquidating assets. And um, this can become interesting um, because different jurisdictions allow different powers. Um, some are very broad and, and some are, are less broad. I think it's, uh, this is a good place to talk about the distinction between rents and profits receivers and equity or general receivers because it's on the presentation that we should talk about this here. Um, but in Minnesota, for instance, if you're foreclosing a mortgage and the mortgage is above a certain amount on a commercial property, you are entitled to a receiver. But you're not entitled to a receiver with the powers of a general receiver. In fact, the statute's very clear that under those circumstances, you can only get a limited receiver. And that limits your ability to do a lot of the things that we're talking about. I think that that's a pretty common rule in other states as well. Uh, so what, what we're focused on here is the equity or general receiver who can be given very broad powers to operate the business, potentially sell the business, and otherwise work to maximize the recovery to all constituents as opposed to a standard mortgage receiver who's going to collect rents, pay for upkeep, deliver anything that's left to the secured party. I just add that you know, it's important to emphasize how um, key the order is on the court. Um, we've got a hearing tomorrow morning in California to clarify a receivership order that was uh, inadequate, I would say. Um, and you know, the, the receiver was appointed months ago and it's been kind of paralyzed because of that. You know, we have parties, this is an appropriate case, we have parties arguing about what can and can't be done. And, but you know, the bottom line is the receivership order just wasn't specific enough. So it's important to get, you know, everything you can in the receivership order at the onset. And um, you know, that allows you to bake in your flexibility and creativity of what you need to do as well. All right. Um. The final point on this slide is, um, well, there's two. The first one is this can be a federal or a state court proceeding. So depending on if you have a federal question or diversity jurisdiction, you can bring a federal, a federal action. Otherwise, you're limited to the state court. And uh, I think we have another slide that goes into greater detail on that. And um, the receiver reports and is accountable to the court. And usually the court will order some sort of um, reporting, you know, regular reporting to occur. But statutorily, they're required as well to give an accounting of what they're doing. Okay, uh, some of the options for the receiver are to operate the business or sell the business. Um, there can be some benefit in limiting success or liability if a receiver is the one doing the sale as opposed to if the debtor, you know, tries to tries to sell. Um, and so that's something to consider. Um, the receiver, the benefit exists because the receiver is a court-appointed um, officer and a neutral third party. Um, the receiver um, is required to comply with the order. And so, as Tom mentioned earlier, if the order is, is not clear, that, that can be a problem. Um, and if the receiver is compliant with the order and with the law, then the receiver is protected um, by that and by using his or her business judgment, uh, which also in turn protects the creditors and the debtor. Um, then the next point is that uh, secured parties may credit bid uh, on the uh, assets. And so a lot of times, uh, you know, there, there may be a buyer that's interested in the assets um, and that, you know, the, the secure creditor is aware of that buyer or is that buyer. And um, the benefit of the receivership as well is the liens can be extinguished upon the sale. Uh, there are some limitations to receivership. Um, it includes um, that there's not an automatic stay in place, though this is a benefit of drafting because if your order includes an injunctive provision, uh, you, can, you can include that and get the same protections as you get from the automatic stay. Uh, depending on your court, your judge may or may not be familiar with the powers and obligations and duties and responsibilities of a receiver. 
sometimes judges will limit receivers too much, and um, sometimes the receivership will be filled with a particular buyer in mind, but then that buyer is outbid, uh, and the bids are public record. They, they're going, they go into the court record, so it's not always a, a clear situation if there's a buyer that wants to buy the asset. I mean, your receiver has a fiduciary duty. If there's a higher and better bid, he's supposed to take it. And if your receiver is well advised, he's not going to hesitate to take a higher or better offer, even if it's not the plaintiff's preferred offer. Um, so that that is a, a factor that you know you need to keep in mind. Although for secured creditors generally, the higher and better offer is always something you love to get. Yes. yes. Have there been any analysis, anecdotal or otherwise, that would suggest that um, uh, bankruptcy sale orders command a higher sales price than, uh, than orders? I'm not aware of any uh, you know, academic literature demonstrating that, but yes, a bankruptcy sale order is generally viewed as being the gold standard in terms of protection against claims, uh, successor liability claims, and therefore you can get a better price in bankruptcy if you've got certain types of claims against the estate, such as envi federal environmental claims, you're going to want to go into bankruptcy court because you're going to want to make sure you get rid of those and you can't do that in state court. Uh, so it really is something you look at under the circumstances. What I've found, and I'll let, let the others uh, add their perspective, for middle market and smaller companies, when you don't have environmental problems or you don't have difficult IP problems uh, and you don't have tort claims, you probably are going to be better off going through one of these alternatives and the buyer is probably not going to pay a lot less uh, as a result. But if you've got those circumstances or if you have a very large case, then you probably will want to go through bankruptcy. I haven't seen any anything in the literature in terms of um, you know kind of formal economic analyses of outcomes. Um, two other limitations of receiverships are uh, you generally cannot recover preferential transfers in in this type of action um, as compared to bankruptcy where you can, and there's also not a cap on lease rejection damages. Um, and so those are also considerations to take into account. And I, I just add the lease rejection cap, uh, you know, it's important and, you know, contracts themselves are important whether you can assume an assignment, um, you know, in bankruptcy you can do that. And outside of bankruptcy, you know, typically unless you have court order you can't do that. But you want to always keep that in mind because we're talking about a going concern here and you need to figure out you know, what contracts are valuable and whether they're assignable or not. And that always goes into the calculus of what option you might pursue. Yeah. All right, uh, so some of the benefits of federal receivership actions are that the receivers are typically given very broad powers and they typically have national jurisdiction. So if you have a case that is filed in, uh, say, the District of Utah, you can file ancillary proceedings in all four districts in California, which we did for a case where assets are th you know, located throughout the both of those states. And so that's a, a nice power that gives the receiver an opportunity to act without having to um, you know, uh, learn the, the rules of every state that the assets are located in. Of course, you need federal jurisdiction to be able to be in federal court. So you have to look and see if there's a federal question or if um, there's a statute governing the, the, the industry in question um, or if there's diversity jurisdiction. And diversity jurisdiction can be a real problem when you're dealing with um, borrowers who are LLCs or partnerships because the Supreme Court in its wisdom has concluded that the citizenship of a partnership is any jurisdiction where any of the partners has its citizenship. And for an LLC, by analogy, they've concluded that it's any of the jurisdictions where any of the members have their citizenship. And that can lead to a very difficult time figuring out 
the answer to the question, do I have diversity jurisdiction? A lot of the matters I get involved with are um, uh, private equity back deals. And there's an LLC, an LLC, a partnership. And ultimately, you get up to all of their investors and where are they all located. And they don't want to tell you that. And unless you're really inclined to spend a lot of money on legal fees, filing in federal court, doing discovery on the location of all of these partners so you can figure out whether the court has jurisdiction, and then starting the case, it's easier to just go in state court if you can accomplish the objectives you want to in state court. Um, when you are fortunate enough to lend to corporations, it gets a lot easier because a corporation is located in the state, or as a citizen of the state where it is organized. So uh, you can, for, for US Bank, for instance, if it's not an Ohio corporation, you're good. Right, and a lot of times the receivership actions are filed on a somewhat emergency basis. I mean, you're, you're looking at an asset that's depreciating in value that you know, you're feeling is being mismanaged and you really want to get some, someone in place to take it over before it's, it doesn't have value. So that, that can be an impediment if you're not sure of the jurisdiction. And so sometimes filing in state court is the safer way to go if there's any question about whether you have jurisdiction in federal court. Uh, with respect to state uh, receiverships, uh, as we talked about before, the receiver's powers uh, vary based on the jurisdiction. Um, there's an issue if you have a big corporation that ha or, or entity that has assets in multiple states. You know, the best way to go about getting power, getting the receiver power in uh, both of those. I mean, in, in, in my experience, if you bring an entity receivership, if it's a Delaware entity and you bring the receivership in Delaware court, the Delaware court will be happy to assert jurisdiction over the assets of that entity wherever they may be. That doesn't mean you won't get pushback from the defendant if it's a contested proceeding. Um, but if you do it on the basis of assets, then you're in a situation where court's going to be very reluctant to look at assets that are not in its own jurisdiction. So if you've got a company with plants in three different states, um, that probably means your only option for a receivership that's going to cover the whole thing is an entity receivership in the state where it's incorporated or organized. And we have a handout um, in the materials that gives a comparison of some of the the states, uh, state by state receiverships. So that's something to look at as well. Uh, gives some statutory information. Yes. Quick question, Matthew. I, I deal with more mid market and larger corporate bankers. So the question is, have you ever been successful installing a receiver in these in a mid market or larger corporate context? There's a bias for control on the part of the debtor to have you been successful in doing that, and how did you overcome that, that inherent uh, bias of control on the part of the debtor? So the question is, uh, there's a bias in mid-market and large markets uh, to, to maintain control with the debtor, uh, with the company, and have we been successful in getting a receiver appointed in a larger case like that? I have not in a contested situation. Where I have has been a situation where the owner of the debtor was ready to wash his or her hands or its hands of the failed business. Um, I do think that's a material obstacle because obviously the debtor has the option to file Chapter 11 and take it out of the hands of your receiver. Um, typically in middle market, lower middle market, cases, um, they're not going to be anxious to fight that hard unless it's a situation where you have a debtor who has some kind of emotional uh, attachment to the business. But I mean, with a larger entity, I wouldn't do this on a contested basis unless you've got fraud or some other uh, 
strong basis to get a receiver appointed immediately because if you can get a receiver appointed immediately, you can try to keep them in even if a bankruptcy is subsequently filed. Well, a sort of related question is uh, oftentimes in those circumstances you'll have a chief restructuring officer that's right. in place, right? Is there any advantage in investing that CRO with a receivership power? Actually, once you've appointed a CRO, um, you may not meet the, dis the disinterestedness test for a receivership. So you got to look at that carefully depending on where you're bringing the case. Uh, the fact that they are, and CRO is an officer of the debtor, they may therefore not be eligible to serve as a receiver. Um, oh, repeat the question. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the question is, if there's already a CRO in place, um, have we had success with getting that person appointed as a receiver if a receiver becomes necessary? Fair? Um, and the, if it's cooperative, yes, you can do that. But if there's an objection, if you're in any kind of contested situation, whether you're contesting with the debtor or other creditors, you're probably going to have to find another receiver. We had a case recently where we were in California and we were looking at moving from a CRO structure to an assignment for the benefit of creditors. We concluded we had to get a, a new assignee if we went that route, so we didn't. But we, we, we looked at it in that context recently. Ready? Mm -hmm. um, and the lender considerations for receivership, it may be cheaper than a bankruptcy. It, it gives uh, the, the lender, or the, you know, the plaintiff in the case, the opportunity to possibly select who the receiver is, um, as opposed to in a Chapter 11 when the debtor, more often than not, is retaining control of the process. Uh, it's a way for, for the lenders to address management, mismanagement issues, and uh, court supervision. And in the receivership order, you can prevent other lawsuits uh, from going forward, as we talked about earlier. Okay, so I, I am going to talk about assignments for the benefit of creditors, which we call ABCs, which is another alternative. Um, this is not a restructuring and reorganization alternative. It's a liquidation alternative. It's a similar to a Chapter 7, and it's uh, governed by state statute or common law. Um, level of court supervision depends on the jurisdiction. Basically, what happens is the uh, company executes a general assignment agreement to an assignee, and that assignee then acts as a trustee for creditors. Um, the the uh, company will typically choose the assignee. However, um, you know somebody with a stake in the in the game, like a secured lender, might be able to influence who that assignee would be. Um, and then once the process starts, uh, the assignee just takes over everything. Um, but it's missing from the uh, slide here is there's actually a pre-assignment diligence period that usually goes on. So the assignee um, will typically look at, uh, you know, examine the situation to figure out whether it makes sense to do an assignment and what, um, you know, what the various issues are. So things they'll look at are, you know, they'll do a lien search, uh, lawsuit search, they'll look at assets and liabilities, they'll um, identify critical contracts. Like I said, those are important if they're trying to maintain going concern value. Um, and then they'll evaluate any prior marketing efforts, um, see how much marketing they need to do to fulfill their duties. Um, we uh, represent Theranos, uh, or the assignee in Theranos case. Um, and as you can imagine, with all the issues out there and the controversy and variables, there was an extremely uh, intense, um, comprehensive diligence period before we uh, executed the assignment, which we have recently done. Um, and that, you know, the, the goal there was just to make sure it made sense to do an ABC and that it was possible to fulfill the interests of creditors by doing it through an ABC. Um, so the duties of an assignee include, you know, kind of like I mentioned, to preserve and liquidate the assets and ultimately to maximize value um, and then distribute uh, proceeds of liquidation to creditors. That's usually done um, in accordance with state priority statutes. Those will vary by state by state. Um, one thing you need to keep in mind is the federal government tax uh, claims usually uh, receive priority. Um, so I, I guess in sum, this is a you know it's a it's a trust created by contract. 
and the distressed company assigns its assets and the ASNI acts as a um, trustee for the benefit of creditors. Um, and I, I think your typical situation, well, let's just say this is a very uh, a preferred vehicle for, um, you know, for venture lenders or private equity lenders. Um, you know, there's no Chapter 7 trustee involved. There's less publicity. Uh, it enables uh, board members to uh, resign. Um, and then on your portfolio, it shows up as a sale. If there's a sale that's done. It's not doesn't show up as a bankruptcy. You also getting to the last bullet point on this page. Uh, generally, don't have to worry about having preferential or fraudulent transfers pursued. That's a state by state um, question for assignees here in Minnesota. Uh, there's no preferences that can be pursued except insider preferences under the UFTA, but the assignee by statute has the ability to pursue uh, fraudulent transfers. Tom, I don't know what California is. Yeah, so in California, it's it's a little bit questionable what the statute does uh, provide um, the ability to pursue preferences. So uh, the slide's about what can be accomplished in the ABC, and um, typically what you want to, why you would look to an ABC is um, efficiency and uh, to limit publicity. But again, that depends on um, the state statute on how much visibility there actually will be. Assinees are, um, you know, they're professionals, they're experienced in selling assets, they can do things more um, efficiently, expenses are reduced, um, it's much cheaper than a bankruptcy, uh, assinees are typically paid a flat fee, maybe get an upside of um, you know, the proceeds of, of a sale, and then their uh, professionals need to be paid as well. But that's usually done up front or negotiated up front, whereas you know, in the bankruptcy, you have all the different variables involved. Um, so you can, you can combine the uh, ABC and, and, and the UCC foreclosure process um, to get the protections of the UCC foreclosure. And then you can execute a sale as fast as uh, one to 10 days, um, depending on how much marketing has gone on prior to, the, uh, prior to the ABC. Yeah, I think we were brought in, we had a runway of 14 days, which this is not uncommon in the distressed world, but it's always kind of stressful. And we represented the purchaser in that case, actually, and they um, wanted a third party. They wanted to be done through an ABC to give them some assurance about um, you know, that, that the maximum value was received and to, to provide some protection against successor liability concerns. Um, so uh, so one, one important point on this is the, the ASINI can also operate the business for a limited time, and that's important if we're talking about preserving going concern value. Um, and as noted on here, it can, it can, you, know, you can operate it to complete you know, WIP or to conduct a going out of business sale, whatever the, um, you know, the situation lends itself to. But it's not something that an ASINI typically does for a long period of time. Um, you, know, that's, you would look to receivership or maybe a CRO to, if they're gonna operate the business for a long period of time. Um, but it is a significant advantage over doing Chapter 7. So some limitations of um, an ABC, there's no automatic stay. Um, you know, there's limited protection against successor liability, but like I said, there's, um, you know, there's a third party involved, so that kind of, that's kind of helpful in terms of optics. You know, the, I, I guess a buyer can sometimes lean on getting comfort from if there's a secured lender involved, that the secured lender has done diligence into the title of the um, assets being sold. Um, if there's no court involvement, uh, you can't sell free and clear. If there is court involvement, you can ask for a um, you know, free and clear order, which usually requires notice. Um, and then you know, the contracts and leases, you can't assume and assign them um, without consent. That was another point that I raised earlier. Um, and then there's jurisdictional issues, too. Um, there's varying statutes of very varying degrees throughout the United States. Um, and you know, they, they all have different ABC schemes and, you know, there's, there's some that are more, um, you know, intensive than, than others and the supervision is more intense. So if you have assets and creditors and a company that has, um, you know, operations throughout the United States, query what, um, you know, what states are going to grant comedy to some ABC that's done in a particular state. So that if there's a, you know, you have multiple 
um, constituents involved. That's something to keep in mind as well. It's interesting, though. Um, I've done a lot of work on cases that are in California in the last couple of years. And practitioners in California, regardless of who they're representing, get a lot of comfort if you do things through an ABC as opposed to through a foreclosure sale or um, through some kind of asset sale where you don't have the intervention of this uh, fiduciary for not just the, the entity, but for specifically the creditors of the entity. And that can make it a lot easier to do transactions even if going through it as we have and looking at the specific legal issues, the benefits are somewhat limited. You're just less likely to find somebody coming after you after the fact if you do it through this process, at least in California. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, so I mentioned before that there's, um, you know, states have different, uh, some states have statutes, some don't. It says 33 states plus DC have some form of statute. Uh, what's that saying they say about lawyers not doing math well? Um, I, I think that number is actually higher than 33 states. If anybody wants to see those, I, I think I have a, you can email me and I can, I can send those to you, but I think it is around 39 actually. Um, and they vary in levels of oversight. Um, California is very minimal. There's no co court involvement, typically. Um, and then it's more expansive in Florida and in Washington. And then here's some considerations that we've listed as to um, where you might consider filing. Um, just, you know, like we discussed before, this uh, jurisdiction is definitely an issue that you do want to keep in mind. And to be clear, in California, you do not have to file anything with the court to commence an ABC. Uh, you simply execute assignment documents from the company to the assignee. And the only time that the court gets involved is if there's some sort of claims issue and you want to challenge a claim that's filed by a creditor. And in Minnesota, you do. You file uh, An assignment in Minnesota is basically a voluntary receivership. Signee has the same powers as a receiver has. So, uh, perfect segue. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of an interesting using Minnesota as a comparison because it really does follow, follow act like a receivership. There's a court supervision. You file the the ABC in the court, um, and then um, that commences the the ABC, and you know you provide notice to creditors within 21 days. You need to, um, you know, you need to go to the court to propose a distribution and claims administration process, and then creditors can object through that process. Um, you know, you sell, you can sell free and clear liens, but you need to get a court order. Um, so it, it very much does follow uh, a receiver type um, action. Whereas if you go to California, which in comparison is, um, you know, there's very little court supervision. So, uh, you know, sales are not free and clear. You don't have a court order. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a claims administration process, but it's not done through the court. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, if there's some claims issues, then you would go to a court. And then as we discussed before, you know, you can avoid preferences as well um, in California. Finally, in Delaware, there, there is the filing of a court petition, but um, it, it is, after that, a pretty non-judicial process unless you have disputes. Uh, there'll be limited involvement uh, and supervision of the court. Yeah, and I, I just add on to that. We, um, you know, often assinees will look to file in De Delaware where they have the ju jurisdiction to do so because the statute's a little bit, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit nebulous, it's, and, but you do also have the court involvement as well, so you have the kind of best of both worlds uh, supervision from the court. And, um, you know, I recently, on a case closing motion for an ABC done in Delaware, um, the court advised us that it was getting concerned about people uh, playing a little loose and fast with the rules. They were worried about, um, you know, due process issues, uh, transparency, et cetera. So he conveyed to us that um, Delaware is now looking into providing, um, implementing some guidelines that will provide a little more structure in the procedures in Delaware. So the uh, lender considerations, we've kind of gone through these already um, for an ABC. You know, it requires cooperation of the debtor. 
um, there's no involuntary ABC, but I, you know the lender does have a say in all of this, um, and actually with all these all these different options, the lender should have a say as well. Um, you know, an ABC probably constitutes an event of default under loan documents. It, uh, you know, actually with the contracts, it could very well constitute a breach or default as well. Um, and the ASNI can't use collateral of without a lender's consent. Can't, you know, can't sell sell uh, sell any of the a lender's cons collateral without consent. So the lender usually has a say when going in as to um, you know what mechanism to use and if it's an ABC, uh, you know who who might be the ASNI. Um, and then we discussed this before too, but uh, you can combine an um, ABC and do a UCC foreclosure sale to address uh, junior liens in that process. Any questions on the first two sections? Yes. Yeah. How difficult or how hard is it to collaterally attack decisions of, of a receiver or a trustee in an ABC transaction in bankruptcy? In essence, how hard or easy is it to, to set aside the actions of either of those two people in a subsequent bankruptcy? So the, the question was, how hard or easy is it to set aside actions that a, an assignee or a receiver took in a subsequent bankruptcy case. So, go ahead, go ahead Tom. Oh, that, so with respect to an ABC, I, you know, we don't see that, we don't see that, I haven't seen that at all. And, and I know that Spectre is out there to do, but if you're marketing um, the assets as much as possible and, and papering it as much as possible, I think you're protected. Um, you know, I, I've actually seen instances where somebody will do a liquidation, you know, maybe through a UCC foreclosure, and then put it into a, a Chapter 7 just to provide even more protection with the knowledge that, you know, Chapter 7 trustee is going to look at the transaction. Um, you just need to be confident that you're, you know, the ASNI is doing its job. Um, and, and I think somewhere in the slide, somewhere it, it notes that this is especially, the ABC is especially effective when the uh, secured lenders, um, you know, undersecured significantly, and that's kind of the reason why. In my experience, I, I haven't seen it happen. Theoretically, of course, you could attack uh, an action that's taken prior to the bankruptcy, but if you do an, a sale of assets and it's completed before a bankruptcy is filed, then that property is not property of the estate unless you can avoid the transfer. Um, there is, as far as I know, no protection for a receiver's sale or an assignee's sale equivalent to the protection that foreclosure sales get in bankruptcy, where it's, it is presumptively not a fraudulent transfer, at least not a constructive fraudulent transfer. Um, but there's not a lot of history of these things getting attacked in subsequent bankruptcies either. Just full disclosure, I said I hadn't seen this before. I meant attack through a bankruptcy. We have, you know, received complaints for fraudulent transfers um, and, you know, the assignee being named in that on a few occasions. And typically what happens is the parties suing are just not really knowledgeable about the process when they fully understand what um, had happened. And you know, aside from being angry, they usually dismiss the ASNI in that instance. Yeah, we have uh, one case right now where um, the, the um, ASNI is like being sued in state court. So it's still to be determined. They've brought a uh, request for TRO and preliminary injunction. The TRO was denied against our client, but was being pursued against uh, the buyer of the assets. So uh, we, we don't know the outcome of that yet. Uh, one interesting point, in, in, in California, the uh, Division of Labor has, has determined that ABCs are uh, the functional equivalent of a bankruptcy, and they've allowed um, assignees to have the protections of, of a bankruptcy proceeding. So they've uh, deferred pursuing wage claims uh, and told the, the claimants to uh, go forward with the claims process in the ABC. Anything else? 
So can I just add, add something real quick? I, you know, I, I agree with you that these are mostly small to mid-market companies that, that do this. Um, a lot of the times you want the various constituents to be on board, and in terms of secured lender, they need to be on board. And so if you have a lot of, if you have a large public company, or you have a lot of different um, shareholders, you know, shareholders need to consent to doing an ABC, so it's just not viable. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that these are always small matters. We, uh, we represented an ASNE in a, um, in a sale for a wearable device a company that sold for 20, $24 million. Um, we did one for a digital lifestyle media company that was uh, valued at um, almost $1 billion at one point. So there are, there are exceptions to that. I mentioned Theranos before. That's another exception. But generally, these are for um, you know, smaller to middle market companies. Okay, moving along to the third option, and fortunately I naturally talk fast, so I should be able to get through this in 10 minutes. Um, <clears throat> sale combined with a chief restructuring officer. Um, uh, the CRO appointment is something that requires cooperation. Now when I say cooperation, that doesn't mean smiling cooperation. It can be co cooperation uh, that's obtained via the leverage of cutting off funding. That's usually how it goes. But nonetheless, the debtor needs to appoint the CRO. It, it's not something a lender can do through its own powers. Um, the appointment usually comes from the board or the partners or the members or the managers, depending on the uh, requirements of the document. The uh, organizational statute may limit the power of a CRO to sell. In some states, a corporation can only sell all or substantially all of its assets with shareholder consent. There's no way to kind of get around that and let the CRO do it. Um, LLC statutes are more flexible. Um, the organizational documents may also limit the ability to delegate certain authorities to an officer, which is what a CRO is. Um, what CRO can do, and the reason that it's important when you're trying to preserve um, Going concern value is the CRO can operate the business and cooperate with uh, the sale, whether it can conduct the sale if it's an outright asset sale or it can cooperate with a foreclosure sale. And we've used both structures in, in a recent cases. Using a foreclosure may address um, the limitations that the statutes or the organizational documents place on the ability of an officer to authorize a sale without going back to shareholders or uh, members, and the other thing is um, sometimes this happened recently in one in a case we were working on. A buyer, the buyers or potential buyers will say, "We want this through a UCC sale. We want the benefit of eliminating junior liens, and so we don't want to do a straight asset sale." Um, consensual foreclosure generally. Um, is a UCC procedure and it's informal and non-judicial. Uh, it applies only to personal property, obviously, where you do have real property, you can foreclose on the personal property under the real property foreclosure uh, rules, which are almost always going to be considerably more onerous. Um, the secured party needs to decide uh, whether it wants to do a public sale, which is essentially an open auction, or a private sale. Uh, the big difference is if the secured party wants the right to purchase in the sale, it has to be a public sale with certain exceptions. Um, and you've got notice requirements. Uh, you need to give 10 days is the typical amount of time notice to the debtor, to any junior lien holders, and to any secondary obligors, guarantors, or others who are liable on the debt. Um, all aspects of the sale must be commercially reasonable. Um, this is a flexible standard, but it's very important to document the process so that if the sale is subsequently attacked, you got the proof that you actually did solicit bids from the relevant universe of potential buyers and did seek to get the best possible price for the sale. Um, the secured party will have liability in the event that the sale is determined not to be commercially reasonable. This is one of the reasons we ended up using the ABC approach in the deal that Tom and I worked on, because that way the secured party would not have liability, even though the sale price was essentially a fraction of the secured debt. 
Um, a sale is a uh, foreclosure sale under the UCC is free and clear of junior liens. It does not really provide a lot of protection against successor liability. I was actually kind of surprised to find this out looking at the question. Uh, successor liability, of course, is a state by state um, concept. And in some states, uh, the foreclosure will give you more protection than others, but it's certainly not a get out of jail free card. Um, so when you're going to do a foreclosure, you want to look at the successor liability law in the state where the foreclosure is taking place and make sure you're doing it in such a way that avoids successor liability. Um, the, what can be achieved? The CRO controls operations to preserve going concern value and maximize assets, no judicial intervention. Sale may be quick and cost effective. Private foreclosure sales require only limited notice to a few parties and commercially reasonable marketing. Uh, this can be important when you're in a situation where the um, either the creditor or more likely the former owners of the business is being sold don't want a lot of publicity. It's also a reason why ABCs are used by venture investors to liquidate uh, investments that have failed. And, um, Frequently, somebody doesn't want to advertise to the world that a company they bought has basically gone in the tank and won't cover the secured debt. This is a quieter way to proceed than, than some of the others. And we mentioned that the foreclosure sale does wipe out junior liens. Um, there is, of course, no free and clear order because there's no court. So you don't have uh, the benefit of that. You've got to look at successor liability and fraudulent transfer challenges on their own terms. Uh, there is a Supreme Court case that says that a regularly conducted mortgage foreclosure cannot be challenged subsequently as a constructive fraudulent transfer. Uh, most practitioners believe that that would also apply to a regularly conducted UCC sale if you can prove that it's commercially reasonable. Um, foreclosure sale is as is, where is, and, and buyer uh, may want to get some reps and warranties, may want insurance on those reps and warranties. That's not something you're going to do in a foreclosure sale. Um, and it doesn't address deficiency claims or claims of unsecured creditors. Uh, those will usually be left uh, in abeyance because there'll be nothing to pay them with, which means you've got the risk of future litigation. Question? Nope. Okay. Um, advantages. Speed. Control if the lender has uh, control over the selection of the CRO. Cost and limited publicity, as we discussed. Any questions on that part of the presentation? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, I hope this was helpful.